Okay, let's get going. Yes, thanks. Okay, let's uh, get started. So, um, let's see. Last week we had the uh, the practical on Wednesday and the presentations. Um, I, and remember, the the deal with the presentations is that you all assess them, and then the grade that the presenter gets is the mean of the the grades that his his or her classmates give give them. So um, you you're all supposed to be submitting a grade and a brief comment, optional brief comment, for um, the two, pre two presentations we had last Wednesday. Uh, byung Sark, and email them to Byung Sark using the, the template that I, I emailed out to you. Um, I think we've got 10 of them in so far, so there are a few more still to come in. Um, it would be helpful if you could do it by, by, by now, by the next class, just so that we can you know, gather them all up and uh, send them back to the to the presenters, okay? Is, that, is any, everyone clear on what's, what's involved there? I mean, it's sort of experimental, but I think it should, should work out, so hopefully we can all do that. Okay, so if you haven't sent the comments for last week, please send them uh, to Byung Sak today so we can, uh, we can wrap that up. Um, any other comments or questions before we start going? We're going to do this thing. I sent out a link this morning uh, to a, a Google Doc spreadsheet, which we'll try and use in a few slides time. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. It just seems, seems like a fun thing to try. So we'll see how that goes. OK, so um, today's lecture is about perception. Now. Um, I sort of briefly touched on this in the introduction. The, this is an engineering class, and um, in engineering, we tend to stay away from things which are a little too hard to define. And a lot of the kind of you know psychological processes and perceptual processes sort of fall into that category. But if we're dealing with music, which we are, then we can't avoid talking about perception because we're talking about how uh, Humans, hum, uh, humans, human listeners respond to information that's carried through the air, through sound, and so we need to understand exactly how, or something about how that sound reaches and affects the human listeners to really be able to do anything intelligent with it. So uh, today's lecture is sort of very condensed summary of some aspects of that. We'll talk about um, the structure of the ear and the parts of the body, the brain, the nervous system that are connected to it. That's physiology. Then we'll talk about some psychophysics, which is um, more about sort of the, uh, the empirical results of playing people sounds and seeing how they respond. So we sort of measure the whole system. Then we'll talk about uh, some more specific uh, material on how people perceive pitch and in particular some computational models of how that works in, in humans and other animals. And we'll talk a little bit about how that influences um, our understanding of how people perceive music, which is obviously pitch plus a bunch of other stuff. So um, starting off with the physiology. And this is stuff that you know we've known for a while, because this is what you can tell by cutting people up by looking inside, looking at the actual physical connections of these structures. They're pretty small, but you know, they're there. So the ear is, you know, we have the system for providing the brain information about uh, the variations in air pressure about sound. And it has these multiple parts. We have the outer ear, which is the visible part. Um, but this is actually kind of important because it acts as this acoustic coupler, it's sort of, it's like, it's some extent it's an impedance matcher. The reason that humans are not, you don't have particularly dramatic ears. If you look at something like a cat or, you know, a, a rabbit or something has these huge ears. And they're, they're very much um, 
you can interpret them as impedance couplers to get you know, as much of the energy that's in the free space into this little uh, sensor in the animal's head. But even in, even in humans, ears are very important in, in spatial perception. So we have the ear, then the, that focuses or gathers the pressure variations down into the ear canal, this little tube that goes in, and then inside the, inside the skull, sort of embedded inside the skull is, this, is the sensor, which involves these bones, which basically do a sort of, they're like levers to just convert a very small amount of motion or very weak force over the large eardrum into a, a larger force over a smaller area onto this structure here, which is the, the inner, ear or, inner ear or cochlea, which is this uh, fluid-filled thing. And the, the, the sound waves, the pressure variations travel down here um, and then there are resonance structures in here which, can, which move a little bit, causing nerve firings. And then you have nerves coming off this thing, going up through this big bundle of nerves, the eighth nerve, or auditory nerve, and then going through a bunch of different parts of the brain. The, um, one of the things about sound is that it happens relatively fast compared to the speed that brains do stuff. Neurons have difficulty firing more than a f 100 or a few hundred times per second. Whereas, of course, you know, sound waves, can, we can easily hear s frequencies of several kilohertz, several thousand cycles per second. So there's a lot of sort of low-level processing that has to go on here. I mean, some of it is done in these resonance structures, but some of it is done sort of the, these special purpose neurons, which are like these uh, midbrain. So there's a bunch of stages in here, and then eventually it gets up to the cortex, the sort of the, you know, the more, the evolutionary later, more sophisticated part of the brain that does the stuff that we're more impressed by. I don't know. But there's a, there's a lot of brain structures, and of course we're grossly simplifying, but that's kind of what's going on. Um, the net result is a system for detecting sound which is exquisitely sensitive. Um, the, the quietest sounds that we can perceive if, if we were able to hear, if, if they were a little more sensitive, we'd be able to hear the actual, you know, the, uh, the random or the, just the, the heat-driven variations of air, air molecules just through Brownian motion. So this is basically almost as sensitive as we can get without getting down to the intrinsic noise floor of, uh, of the medium. Um, this part, which is basically a mechanical system, the basic principles of it have been understood for a while. Actually, the original experiments by von Bekesey in the middle of the 20th century involved sort of, you know, taking cadavers, taking out their cochlea and driving them with very high sound levels and then watching them with a microscope to see, what, see how they actually moved, which isn't quite what they do in live animals. But now we have more sophisticated techniques. Of course, this structure is preserved. It's the same in all mammals. So even though we can't do experiments in live humans, there are a lot of experiments which are done on cats and gerbils and ferrets and stuff, where we can actually watch this thing in a, in a, in a live animal responding to sound. It turns out it's kind of complicated, but we know quite a lot about it. Once you get into the brain, of course, things get more difficult because there are you know, thousands or tens of thousands of neurons involved. And although we can do pretty, a pretty good job making recordings from individual neurons, if you want to record from multiple neurons at once, it's very, very difficult because you have to like get probes into these tiny little things. So um, there, are, you know, there's a lot of research going on here, and there's a lot of different areas that have understood have involvement in particular tasks. But you know, we don't have a good detailed model of how this thing works. And this thing, the cortex, is sort of very much we're still at the beginning of trying to understand how sound processing occurs, you know, high-level sound processing occurs in the cortex. So there's some very interesting work being done. That's our basic uh, picture of what's going on in the physiology. Um, here's actually a more detailed picture of the actual, what you'd see if you did a dissection here. And then um, there's this really nice movie I want to show you which is, um, it was put together by this guy, Brandon Pleisch, I think his name is, who uh, is a um, 
he's a medical illustrator, right? He, his, his, his specialty is making illustrations that illustrate medical things. And so he did this as a kind of, a, I think as a, uh, a final project or something, he, he put together this movie about how the ear works. Let's just watch this. It's a, it's a few minutes long. then vibrates in response to the sound. Sounds of a lower pitch or frequency produce a slower rate of vibration. And sounds of lower volume or amplitude produce a less dramatic vibration. Higher frequency sounds produce faster vibrations. The tympanic membrane is cone-shaped and articulates with a chain of three bones called the auditory ossicles. They consist of the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The movements of the tympanic membrane vibrate the ossicles, passing on the information of frequency and amplitude. The three bones pivot together on an axis shown here in red. is due to a series of ligaments which hold the bones in place within the middle ear cavity. The anterior malleal ligament and the posterior incutal ligament are of particular importance for the pivotal axis. Two structures which normally obscure this view of the middle ear have been removed. They are the chordae tympani nerve and the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. Through the ossicles, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transferred to the footplate of the stapes. The stapes moves with a piston-like action, which sends vibrations into a structure called the bony labyrinth. The labyrinth is filled with a fluid called parallel. If it were a completely closed and inflexible system, the movement of the stapes would be unable to displace the parallel, and therefore unable to send vibrations into the bony structure. Due to the flexibility of a membrane called the round window, the stapes movement can displace the parallel, allowing vibrations to enter the labyrinth. The corridor leading to the round window is found within the spinal portion of the bony labyrinth, known as the cochlea. Vibrations produced by the stapes are drawn into the spiral system and return to meet the round window. The portion of the spinal passage in which vibrations ascend to the apex of the cochlea is called the scala vestibuli. The descending portion of the passage is called the scala tympani. A third structure, called the cochlear duct, is situated between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross section, the membranes separating the two fluid filled systems are visible. They are Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. The membranes are flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scale of the stipuli. 
The movements of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scale of timpani. A specialized structure called the organ of corti is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of corti is stimulated, which sends nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of corti called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of sound. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer to the base. This arrangement is known as tonotopic organization. Together, this sequence of events is responsible for our acoustic perception of the world around us. So, um, you know, it's kind of a complex picture, and uh, it's good to, it's very nice to have that uh, animation so that you can sort of see those structures. Um, be better than my drawings and in 3D. But um, there are, there are some questions still, right? Uh, and so, The, the, the movie explained that there's this long, this, the spiral structure which contains this, which we unwrap it, is basically this long tube where the bones, the stapes, push in in response to the sound waves. And then there's fluid in here, which there's some propagation of the variations in here. Yeah. Do we have any uh, fluid microphones? You mean, can we? Can we listen? Can we yeah, happen? sure. I mean, it's actually easier, right? Because actually the forces are larger in fluids. So it's the same thing. I mean, a microphone basically just has, I mean, the cl a classic microphone has a little diaphragm which moves a, you know, a coil in a magnetic field to generate electricity. And so, you know, if you, uh, the diaphragm either pushes against air in a normal microphone, but you can have it directly in contact with, with, with fluid and it works fine. Hydrophone oh, okay. is what it's called, yeah. But um, getting one in here would be a little bit difficult because it's kind of small. But um, actually, there's a colleague, John Kamisis, who builds these thin film devices. And he's working with um, Lisa Olson up in the uh, medical school to do exactly that, to put some pressure sensors, actually, that you could put inside the cochlea to, to measure the, the pressure directly, which is pretty amazing. So. The, we saw that there's basically the structure with something going on, and there are a bunch of, there's this basilar membrane in here, which has all these nerve, has the hair cells and connected to nerves, which is, which is sensing the energy at different frequencies. And there's a question of how, how that happens. And what it is, it's, there's some, the, the details are possibly rather, rather more complicated. But basically, we can view this thing as a, as a resonant, membrane, but the resonance changes along the length. And so at the beginning up here, close to the window, it's very stiff, which means it has a high resonant frequency. And then it becomes uh, more floppy the further you go down, which means its resonant frequency is lower. 
And what it, what, the way I've understood it is that the sort of the, the energy comes in here and it sort of travels down and then at some point, if it's like a sinusoidal energy, there's some point here where the, uh, the resonance of the membrane matches the frequency. And then that's where you get large motion of the basal membrane and you sort of get the energy transferred across and then it sort of comes out the bottom. So there'll be sort of, for a given frequency, there'll be very little excitation and then suddenly the excitation will grow, reach a peak and then immediately die off because after that there's sort of the energy lost and there's no more energy being, the energy's been transferred and there's nothing transferred further down. So there's this um, animate, another animation, a rather simpler animation of that here, but this is natural results of a, a finite element model of, uh, of the, of the cochlea. See, in order to make it floppy, it also gets longer, wider, so that gives it lower free, lower, a lower resonant frequency. So this is where the sound's coming in, where it's sort of narrow and, and, and taut. But then as you get a frequency of a certain, a stimulation of a certain frequency coming in, there'll be some point at which you get large motion. And then at a higher frequency, that point occurs sooner, closer to the, to the uh, uh, input, closer to the stapes. And so that's the uh, sort of, that's you know, obviously highly exaggerated, but that's sort of what's going on. And then if you have a mixture of these two sinusoids, you get a, a superposition of these two motions, that the structure is, uh, the motion here is largely linear because it's uh, at least if you think about this physical structure, it's basically operating in its linear mode. Okay. And so that's how you can basically, that's how you can understand the ear as having produced a, 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 Fourier, a Fourier analyzer, something that takes sound pressure, one dimensional variation with time, and breaks it down into a set of different frequency components. And so you have this map that converts the position along the cochlea into the resonant frequency, the center frequency of, uh, of the analysis. In the video, we saw that there were, the, I don't know if you noticed this, but when they were talking about the hair cells, there are actually two kinds of hair cells. For each sort of slice here, there's the set of the so-called inner hair cells, which are come in three rows, which are actually the ones that are sensitive that... Um, that when they're sort of, when they're stretched, they, they cause nerve firings. Then there's one row of outer hair cells, and they're actually um, driven by impulses coming, or nerves coming the other way, flowing from the brain to the ear. And they're also controlled locally. They're obviously involved in some kind of uh, feedback system, and there's some debate about how this actually works or what's going on. But the basic uh, situation seems to be that the at any point in the ear, the feedback is driven such that, that the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the system is almost oscillating so that a very, very small amount of additional energy will then sort of be amplified and push it into something. That this is how you can get uh, very great sensitivity. Also, you can, it's how you can get a, a wide dynamic range because by modulating that feedback, you can make a system that, you know, is... In one state, it's extremely sensitive, and then if you've got very loud sounds, you can turn it down and you can make it more adaptive. And that seems to be kind of important because not only are we very, very sensitive in our most sensitive regions, we're actually able to deal with a very wide range of sound pressures, you know, over 100 dB or, you know, 100,000 ratio in energy, which is not something you can easily do with biological systems normally. So there's, there's a lot going on. Obviously, we're not going to get into the detail, but it's a, a complex setup. Oh, so here's, here's a picture with the, my sort of cartoon of the uh, basilar membrane with the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells, the inner hair cells sending information up, the outer hair cells feeding back. And I mean, it's kind of the same thing, but I guess you can, by the same mechanism, you can sort of tense, you can push against the, ten, the uh, tectoral membrane. Are they analogous to our external hair cells? They're analogous, I don't really know, but they're analogous and, and they do have these kind of like little uh, structures sticking out, yeah. little uh, 
I don't know what keratin structures or something. So they um, they have hair coming out, but they've got. I don't think our external. I don't know how. I'm not sure what the deal is oh, with I sensitivity. Yeah, yeah, they're hair cells because this little bit of stuff in in here is actual is actual hair. I guess don't really know, but they've got stuff sticking out. They've got structures sticking out, which are you know not just cell wall body, but something else. It's something that's a little bit elongated and a little bit stiff. But the, the, I don't know anything about cell biology, but somehow the mechanical motion due to the motion from the sound opens some, um, you know, ion channels, which then causes the cell to depolarize, which then causes the, the neuron to fire, causes the nerve impulse to, to get triggered. Uh, in human ears, there are like 3,000 of these sets of hair cells, so sort of 3,000 frequency samples, and they, each of them has multiple nerves, so there are about 20,000 nerves going up the auditory nerve, 20,000 individual nerve fibers in the auditory nerves. That's kind of like the, all the information that we get about sound, and then of course, like I said, each one of those can fire at most about 100 times a second. So that's actually the total. And the only information that a nerve sends is when it fires. That's just, it's just a one-bit time information as the moment that it fires and the fact that it fired. But that's the limit of the information. So it's not actually that much information, but um, it's enough. And of course, because these things are so sensitive and so small, they're quite easy to damage, which is why, you know, it's not a good idea to listen to loud music a lot of the time. Okay. Um, so the nerves, if you have, you know, locally you're going to have motion which looks kind of like a sinusoid because it's this resonance structure being driven at resonance. And then you can look at this motion and you can look at the, the, the nerve firings coming out. The nerve firings are just these little pulses, but they're, but they're kind of stereotyped. They don't, the shape doesn't change. It's just when they happen. And typically, the pulses fire close to the point of maximum displacement, but it doesn't always happen. If it's going to happen, it'll happen close to the, the top, by, in, you know, depending on how you measure these units. But it'll it sort of happen stochastically, depending on the cycle. So you end up with a kind of a histogram of when the firings occurred relative to the uh, motion, and you get something where they fire in the positive cycle. They don't fire at all in the negative cycle, except sometimes they fire at just random times. Um, so that's kind of the nerves in the, 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 the actual cochlear nerves. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, there are a bunch of different neurons which these things connect to in the midbrain, and then they have a variety of different responses. You can measure particular nerves at different points in the brain. You'll, get, you'll see a bunch of different things going on. One classic thing is you could look at a nerve, you found some nerve in the, in the midbrain that's connected to, that's involved in, in hearing, and then you, f you play the animal a set of tone bursts and you sort of you do this over and over again, you build a histogram of where the, where the nerve fires, and you know, like one millisecond bends or something like this, and you get a picture like this, that if this nerve is in the region that's responding to this particular tone, you'll see this nice density of firings during the burst and not during the, the non-burst region. But very often there'll be a, a maximum, there'll be an onset peak like this, and then it'll sort of die away to a, to a steady state. So there's very strong, very low level evidence for onset emphasis in, in the hearing system. Because onsets are, we, we inf you, you could justify this by saying, well, onsets are kind of important because they mean something's happened. But, um, Regardless of how you explain it, this is high, commonly observed. For a particular nerve like this that you found, you can um, vary the frequency of the tone and see how much firing you get with different frequency. Now, because we understand that the cochlea is sort of filtered by frequency, we expect some later nerve to also show that same response. And the way you can, one way you can measure this is by adjusting the level of the frequency to get a certain density of firing, a certain number of firings per second. And that will give you, because then it, that gives you kind of a, a, a constant reference point. 
So you get a curve like this that for a particular nerve you can say, well, if there's some frequency where I can have a very low level of sound to, to get that um, rate of firing. But if I, if I put in a different frequency, I can still make this nerve fire at that rate, but I have to use a much higher level. And so you end up with these, in this case, these V-shaped curves indicating that the nerve is most sensitive at this frequency and has uh, a decay of sensitivity for other frequencies. This is two different nerves, right? So one is sensitive around you know, 800 hertz, and one is sensitive around about 6,000 hertz here. This is a log frequency axis, but even on a log frequency axis, these curves are somewhat asymmetric. For frequencies below the best frequency, you can get quite a lot of uh, excitation, but for free, you know, even you raise the level, you can get some response. For frequencies above the best frequency, um, it's very hard to get, you know, th this, this curve falls off very rapidly here. And if you think about what we said about how the sound waves travel down the cochlea, if the frequency is higher than the best frequency, basically the nerve is now beyond the point at which the energy is sort of been shunted. And so there's basically nothing is happening. What this means is that actually um, high frequency, if you listen to a mixture of frequencies, a high frequency doesn't interfere with the perception of low frequencies at all, right? That the high frequency is sort of dying out very rapidly at a very early part of the cochlea, and the low frequency part carries on through. But a low frequency sound can interfere with the perception of a high frequency sound because the low frequency energy has to sort of pass through the high frequency region before it gets there. And so there's this sort of asymmetric effect of frequency masking. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, yeah. Can you say that? I didn't quite get it. Uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me talk about it later when we talk about masking, okay? I'll, I'll come back to that. A single nerve, um, if you sort of look at, so this is now the firing rate, spikes per second, versus the level, the intensity in dB, you know, just like the actual energy level of the sound. A single nerve will sort of, you know, at some It'll have no, it'll have sort of its, its baseline response, and then suddenly it'll start picking up. It'll increase with energy level, um, but then at some point it'll saturate. So here this thing's saturating like 300 spikes per second. And then even if you increase the intensity, it won't go up at all. And this range is typically maybe 20 or 25 dB between the, the quietest sound that it responds to and the sound, the sound level at which it saturates. But like I said, our actual sense, our dynamic, the range of sounds we can perceive is more like 100 or, or 120 dB. So there are two ways to do this. One is that there's a, a variation of, of nerves, that some nerves have a very low spontaneous rates. So they, don't, they don't start firing until you get to quite a high level. And some have high spontaneous rates, so they're, they're more sensitive to low level sounds. So you can have different nerves responding to different ranges of the sound. And then also there are these feedback mechanisms, these efferent mechanisms, which are harder to, harder to pin down experimentally, but seem to be important in our ability to adapt to different sound levels. OK, so um, you can't see this plot very well, but this is actually some experimental data where they took, I think it was a cat, and played it a sound, like a synthetic vowel or something. And then they went, but they played it over and over again. Then they went through with their little probe, and they recorded the firing at a very large number of different fibers, um, maybe a, a hundred or so. And then plotted the response rate as a kind of, the response histogram as a waterfall plot here. And what you see is that for different frequencies, they respond differently, but it's basically, it's picking up, you know, you can see these sort of pulses from this, Maybe this sort of, uh, you know, voice-like voice, voice -like signal, which has a, a pulse and some resonance at different times. And so you, you end up with, you, that inspires these kinds of uh, signal processing models of what's going on in terms of a bunch of bandpass filters with rectifiers. And you can get something, it doesn't look very good, but you can, you can get at least qualitative approximations to this kind of behavior quite easily out of uh, signal processing models. So you can get these models that um, uh, 
approximately or more in, in some qualitative respects uh, give you some va variables which respond, which are, which act a bit like the the nerve firings you'd expect to see in the ear. And so that's, that's kind of interesting because if you can have a good model of that, then it gives you a way to test theories about well, what, what are the things that the brain could be getting out of sound or not. Because you know, there's certain things which are just not being preserved by this kind of analysis. And so typically these models, they'll have some kind of fixed linear filter for the outer and middle ear, the, the pinna and the, you know, the transduction through the bones in the middle ear. Then there'll be a bunch of filters and you know, these, each filter is sort of trying to simulate the particular resonance of a particular part of the basilar membrane. And then there'll be, you know, now we have sort of band pass, narrow band signals, and there'll be some kind of model of the inner hair, inner hair cell, which will basically, you know, uh, it'll be more likely to give a response for a more positive signal, has no response for a negative signal, and has some saturation, et cetera, like that. And so you, what you, that can give you is a, something that looks like a spectrogram. So it's a, an image showing uh, intensity as a function of frequency channel and as a function of time, time varying intensity across a range of channels. But instead of being labeled in hertz, it's now labeled in, in channel. These channels are non-linearly non uh, laid out in frequency. And you, know, you get various non-linear effects in the in the overall re relationship of the intensity to, to the sound, the nerve firing, firing rate or whatever it is being simulated in response to the input sound intensity. So there are a large number of different models of this kind, all simulating different parts to different levels of uh, um, accuracy. You know, some of them are tuned to match particular nerve data, but there's no single model which, which is accepted as being, you know, the uh, the right one. It's sort of, it's still, everyone has, uh, there's still quite a lot of variation in opinion about how you have to do this. And partly that's because it's just, it's actually quite complicated. These things, you know, the ear itself is not at all linear. So if you try and fit it with a linear model or even a mostly linear model, it doesn't, doesn't fit that well over all situations. And then it's, it's quite difficult to gather the kind of data that we saw. So it's not like you can just, you know, gather the data once and then you're done. Um, there's still different data sets that you can match with different kinds of models. Okay, so that's a quick, quick overview of what we know about ears and how we can model it computationally. The next thing I want to talk about is psychophysics, which is kind of a very different approach to understanding how hearing works. Instead of sort of cutting it open and trying to see what's going on inside, we treat the listener as this kind of complete system. We play the listener some sounds, and then we ask them to do some kind of task. If they're human listeners, we can ask them to press a button or write something down. You can do this with animals, so you can train them to you know, peck for a reward or something. It's amazing how much information you can get out of even simple animals with these kinds of psychophysical tests. So there's a very sophisticated you know, scientific process involved in making these kinds of experiments and you can get quite a lot of information out. And the, the, the key idea is that there's a, a physical dimension, which was sometimes noted by the letter phi, which is like the, the physical intensity of the sound. And there's a psychological dimension, sometimes noted by the letter psi, Greek psi, um, which is the sort of the, the, the animal's internal mental response. And the link between these two is kind of the job of, of the sensory system, and it's something that we can try and characterize through experiment. And there are a bunch of different areas where sensation and perception come into play, obviously sound, sight, but also kind of, you know, the sense of where your body is and things like this, the, the ability to, to decide how heavy something is. That's another kind of uh, sensory modality. Because our sensory systems are pretty good, right? Normally, when there is a sound, I can hear it, whatever that means. But um, it's quite reliable. Sometimes we sort of forget about the distinction between these two. 
right? That you, you have the illusion that you're directly perceiving sound, but of course, as we've just seen, what you're really getting is a bunch of nerve firings coming down this you know, set of nerve fibers, it's quite a lot, it's quite, quite, a, quite a long way removed from a direct measurement of the sound pressure. But the system is well enough uh, put together that that distinction is sometimes, it's mostly invisible. But it is, it's a very real thing which we, uh, which we can study and try and understand. So, um, how do, you, how do you measure this thing? Well, sort of things you can measure, like you can try and measure how reliably someone can tell two different sound levels apart, or two different sounds apart. Right, so if I play a, a, a noise burst and I play another one, if I ask you if it was louder or softer, you know, it's, in some cases it'll be very easy to agree. In some cases it'll be like, well, I can't really tell. And then you get to down to this idea of the just noticeable difference, which is kind of like you can fairly, in different things, you could do the same thing with weights. If I, give you two weights, ask you which one is heavier. You get to this kind of minimum increment of the sensory dimension, the physical dimension that gives you a, a reliable judgment in the sensory dimension. Another way you can do it is by, by giving two sensations and then asking the subject to say, well, how much bigger or smaller was the second one compared to the first one? And that's kind of like, it's sort of a an, un, an ill-defined question. It's like, if I play you two sounds and ask you how much louder the second one was, it's like, well, what, you know, how, how am I supposed to measure that? But it turns out, if you ask people to do this, they do actually um, often give reasonably consistent results. People will say, yes, that was twice as loud, or that was one and a half times as loud. Um, we'll see how that plays out. It, in a lot of these dom domains, it turns out that the, the just noticeable difference change in intensity which is, you know, leads to, a con leads to the same perceived amount of change is in proportion to the, the absolute level. And what that means is that the, um, the log of the perceived value is proportional to the log of the actual physical intensity. Um, in the case of loudness, if L is your internal psychological loudness level, perceived loudness level, a lot of experiments result in the, that being proportional to the um, intensity, the physical, loud, the physical intensity of the sound raised to the, to the, point, the, the power 0.3. So a log, log proportionality like this means that it's a power law in the direct variables. Right? If I take the log of both sides of this, it says the log of L is 0.3 times the log of I, which is that proportionality. Remember that we define decibels as being the 10 times the log base 10 of intensity or 20 times log base 10 of amplitude squared because the energy is proportional to the amplitude squared. So in that case, the log base 10 of loudness would be 0 0.03 times the intensity in dB. Or if we turn that around, the intensity of dB is like 33 times the log base 10 of loudness, which means if we make something... Um, in order to hear something as being 10 times louder, which would mean a, one more unit in log base 10 of loudness, we'd have to make it 33 dB louder, right, if this, if this worked. But that's, the, that's what you get, basically. What that means is the, one of the reasons we like dB is because it's sort of a, a fixed change in dB corresponds to a, a fixed ratio in loudness. So here's um, the results of a typical experiment where you get played sounds at different levels, you rate them as in loudness, and then you sort of plot them on a graph, and you see there's this kind of linear fit. Although this is from um, a particular experiment where they didn't get a 0.3 value, they got a 0.22 value. What I would like to do now is actually try this experiment for ourselves. So this is where we uh, switch to that spreadsheet that I sent you in the um, email. So. Uh, for those of you who have access to a web browser right now, and if you, if they, you have trouble getting online, then DPWE Airport should be available to you right now. But here's what you should get. There's this um, spreadsheet like this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to listen to 20 s brief sound examples like this. And what I want you to do is when you hear each one, 
Just type in a number now. You'll hear a reference. The reference we're going to call 100. And so you type in the loudness of the second tone, of the test tone, if the first one is 100. So if it sounds twice as loud, you put in 200. If it sounds half as loud, you put in 50. Right, so I don't know. And then, yeah, I've got the names. I've got the uni IDs of all the student, registered students here. So find your column. Put that in. And then at the end, we'll immediately be able to... Uh, We've got, we're going to calculate the average over here, and then we'll be able to um, we'll be able to plot plot the plot the graph. So um, as as we do this, probably we're going to see everyone else's numbers appearing, but try not to be influenced by what other people are putting in. Just try and figure out for yourself what you think the number is, then put it in, because <coughs> obviously there's some amount of uh, feedback. So let's listen to this. Hopefully, it'll be obvious. <laughs> loudness scaling. In this experiment, you will rate the loudness of 20 noise samples, which are preceded by a fixed reference. First, you hear the reference sound, followed by the strongest and weakest noise samples. OK. So first, we're going to hear the the reference and then the strongest and loudest is just to give you kind of a, a sense of the range and then we hear the individual sounds. Okay, you can all hear that. Now, the 20 samples. For each sample, write down a number reflecting its loudness relative to the reference. So, everybody ready? Okay. So what's the scale? 100 is the reference, and then I don't know what the scale is. What, what, what's the loudest and what's the quietest? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I, I don't know. It's like however much louder it was than, than it was. Percentage wise, it's like <coughs> Yeah. And the reference was the first one? And the yeah. And the two were the range? That was the range of sounds that we're going to hear. That was the quietest and loudest we're going to hear, yes. But you'll, you'll hear the reference every time. That was the first one. Okay, you should have reached the bottom now. Um, that was kind of interesting, watching everyone's numbers appear. Let's see how we did. <laughs> 
Uh, if you didn't wish to reach the bottom, yeah, we're going to get some, we're going to get some numbers messed up here. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Well, let's see what we get anyway. So there's there's going to be some some more complicated noise here just because of people getting out of sync possibly. But okay. So that's our plot. So there was some, though each each no each level was repeated several times. Levels varied between minus twenty and plus twenty dB relative to the reference, which was zero. And then this is the log base ten of the of the average rating. So two is a hundred in there. Well, it's changing in real Sorry. time. That's okay. Um, so there's quite a spread here, just a little bit. This is really cool. It's just updating in <laughs> real time. Um, you know, it's kind of it's not it's not so great that we actually get like for this this thing, which is yeah, this is this has got to be desynchronization, right? Because this sound, which was like pretty quiet, 15 dB down, one time everyone got yeah, it was quite a lot less, and then another time people get it, it was actually louder than the standard which must be because they were actually entering the number for the thing next door. So I'm tending to believe the uh, sort of the, the main trend and reject the outliers. And that looks like uh, about 0.35, no, point, yes, 0.35. So if this is 2, this is minus 10 dB, and this is 1.65, that's 0.35 down, log base 10. So that would actually be the... Uh, Exponent is 0.35, and that's sort of that's. Here's plus 10, which is about 2.2, so that would actually be less. That would be about 0.2. But the yeah, it's not bad. I don't know. If you stand further away, right, you see the trend better. Um, yeah, we were hoping to see this as a straight line. We see something. Maybe next time. Um, I'll try and cue people with the numbers or something, just so that we, I think that was the problem. We, lo we got lost, we got out of sync with that. All right, well. Okay. Yeah, I was, so, you know, I was trying not to, yeah, there definitely is a learning curve. And very often when they do these kinds of tests in, in you know, in psychology labs, they have their subjects, their subjects they've used a lot, who once they've been, you know, done these kinds of experiments a lot, they start to give more and more consistent answers, which is nice, because then you can have small error, bar, error bars on your plots and stuff. And then it's like, well, are you really measuring, you know, the the truth about people, or are you just sort of training people to do something, and then you're measuring their ability to reproduce what you want? Um, there's not, you know, there are arguments for both ways. Certainly, there are some, you know, it's not clear what you're really asking people to do when you're asking them to rate these things. But the surprising thing is, you can get remarkably consistent results under good conditions with this kind of thing. It's interesting that what Hartman found was a was a shallower curve, right? So people tended not to rate the changes as large as what, what the, the textbook figure is. But here we saw some numbers which were larger than that, like people rating something as 600, which is like six times as loud as the standard, which is probably, that, that's pretty loud. But I guess, you know, it's, uh, well, what, what does it mean anyway? It's up to you. Um, so that scaling judgment is pretty, is pretty untethered. It's like, well, you know, what does twice as loud mean? You can get more, it's an easier experiment to do to have, uh, to ask people to scale things so they're equal. 
And so one thing you can do is like you can play someone a, a tone at like one kilohertz, and you can play them a tone at some other frequency, say 100 hertz, and, and give them a knob, to just a volume knob, to adjust the loudness, and say, okay, just the, or just the intensity, just the intensity until it's the same loudness as the one kilohertz tone. And then you end up with these curves like this, which is at different frequencies, what was the actual physical intensity that subjects selected to match the perceived loudness of a reference tone at one kilohertz. And so these, here are the reference tones at one kilohertz are different, phys different physical intensities over a range of you know, 120 dB here. And what we see is that you know, around one kilohertz, we're actually a little more sensitive to frequencies maybe around three or four kilohertz that you, to get the same intensity, you actually need a less intense signal at this frequency. And that's probably due to resonances in the actual ear canal. But as you go low, further down in frequency, then typically our sensitivity goes down, so you have to get a more and more intense signal to get the same perceived loudness. But what's more interesting is that this, these curves bunch together, which means that if you, as you vary a one kilohertz tone from zero to 80 dB, you get some range of perceived loudness. But actually, at that same amount of energy, a 100 hertz tone is, is too quiet to be perceived. We don't actually begin to hear something until you're up to like 40 dB above that intensity level. But then, between that and like 100 dB, it's the same, at 100 dB, it's more or less the same energy level at one kilohertz. So this range of perceived loudnesses becomes compressed. And what that means is that the loudness, as, you've, as you increase the physical intensity, the loudness grows more rapidly. You know, if, if it takes you 10 seconds to go from 0 dB SPL to 100 dB SPL, at one kilohertz, you sort of hear this steady growth of, of, of loudness over that 10 seconds. At 100 hertz, you hear nothing for the first four seconds. And then for the last six seconds, you hear the same range of intensity from the quietest sound to very loud, 100 dB. But it happens more rapidly. And so this is one of the aspects of the nonlinearity of, of hearing perception, that the same change of physical intensity will give rise to a different relative change in perceived, intense, perceived loudness depending on what frequency you're dealing with. And in fact, depending on what level, because after, you know, these, these curves are close together, meaning you have rapid growth, but then above some intensity level, the curves kind of stay more parallel, so you have consistent growth uh, across different frequencies with intensity change. None of this is tremendously important, although I don't know, sometimes you, on a, on a Stereo, you see a, a button called loudness or a knob called loudness. And what, that, what the rationale for that, what it does is it boosts the bass and the, and the travel and the high frequencies. But the rationale is that if you're listening to something at a low frequency level, in order to make it have the same perceived spectrum as it would at a higher frequency level, you have to boost these low frequencies to push them into the same range of audibility. But the, the point about showing you this is just to sort of illustrate how complicated it is to try and actually match, um, try and produce, you know, a, a, an accurate objective model of what's going on in perception. That these, these, these uh, phenomena are actually pretty complicated when you try and tie them down and measure them precisely. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so here's something which is um, more has, has more important engineering consequences. And this is the, the idea of masking. So if we, on the, on the Fletcher-Munson curve, these things are called Fletcher-Munson curves, this bottom curve is basically the quietest sound you can hear. Any, any, any sound below this level is so quiet you don't hear it at all. And so you can call that the threshold, the threshold of hearing. And so here's, a, here's that basic curve again, log frequency against intensity. And this is the sound that if, it's, if, a, if a particular sound frequency, a sinusoidal component, falls low this curve, the listener can't hear it at all. But we can measure that, and we can measure that by sort of playing them a tone, saying press a button if you hear the tone, or you know, did you hear it or not? And they make a choice, and then you decide what, at what level they can consistently say they do hear it when it really is present. We can repeat that experiment, but instead of playing, playing the sound against quiet, we can have a, a steady, 
tone present at a particular level. And what happens is that for frequencies far away from the masking tone, the steady tone, the threshold remains the same. But for frequencies close to this masking tone, it turns out that the presence of the masking tone elevates the threshold. We have a so-called masked threshold. That is, uh, this tone here, this gray tone, in quiet, that would be plainly audible. But in the presence of this masking tone, you can't actually tell whether it's present or not. And part of what's going on here is, you know, those V-shaped curves we saw for the nerve responses. When we have this tone present, it's not only exciting the nerves for which this is the best frequency, but it's also exciting a range of nerves nearby. And that kind of uh, baseline motion makes it harder for the brain to detect the small amount of motion that this added tone would, would, would induce. And so basically, because of our limited dynamic range, um, the, the fact there's already this sort of firing and motion going on due to this first tone makes it impossible to, to distinguish that this second tone has been introduced. So you have this masking threshold, and basically the presence of sound in a particular frequency range reduces your sensitivity to other sounds in the nearby frequency range. And this is how, this is the basis of psychoacoustic uh, audio coding, like MP3, MPEG audio, that basically it reduces the, the quantization step size in a particular frequency range such that the quantization noise is always below this threshold, but only just below it, which means you can actually use pretty crude. Because it turns out this gap here is maybe 10 or 15 dB. That if I have a tone at a certain level, then if I add noise nearby, and it's like 15 dB below it, you, can, you can't really tell there's noise as long as it's close enough in frequency. And so I can have quantization noise at that level and... Uh, it doesn't affect the perceived quality of the sound at all. This is what happens simultaneously if, if I play the sound and the, the masking tone and the probe tone at the same time. It actually even has some um, persistence in, in time. So you can have this kind of masking skirt here. If I have this masking tone, which is a certain frequency at a certain level for a certain time duration, and then if I have this, I can have this kind of time versus frequency versus level plot, which shows you the range, you know, the area where I won't be able to perceive a tone at all. So this is, you know, during, during the masking tone, there are these sort of flanking frequency bins. But then after the masking, even after the masking tone st stops, there's this tail where it takes a while for the sensitivity of the system to, to recover. And that's, you know, 100 milliseconds or more. It's not that long, but it's long enough that you can make a, you know, you can actually exploit this in, in coding as well. That you, if there's been a loud tone, you don't have to worry about uh, the quantization noise in that region for 100 milliseconds or so. It's even a backwards. There's a slight backwards effect here. That if you have a quiet tone, if a loud tone comes after it within a few milliseconds, then it, it can prevent you from being able to perceive the quiet tone that if it wasn't followed by a loud tone, you would be able to perceive relatively easily. So again, this is also a very complex psychophysical function, but it's one that's been quite extensively investigated because of its utility in, uh, in psychoacoustic coding. Um, so we've sort of seen a little bit about how these things are measured, how we can do experiments with listeners to ask them to perform tasks or to respond in certain ways. You know, a classic um, uh, paradigm is the two-interval force choice, where you play someone something, and then you ask them to decide that it's one of two alternatives. Like, you could play them like a stimulus that is a noisy stimulus that maybe has a tone embedded in it, and you say, does it have the tone embedded or not? You know, you have a two, you have a forced choice between these two choices. Or you could play them two sounds and then play them a third sound and say, well, is it, was it the first sound or the second sound, which is the ABX paradigm. The interesting thing is that if you give people, if you force them to make a choice, sometimes they'll say, oh, I, I don't know, I really can't tell, but okay, I'll press one button because you make me do it. And it turns out that even though they may say they can't tell, sometimes they are actually making the right choice, even though consciously they don't have a lot of confidence. So, whereas if you ask them, just you know, press the button when you're sure, then there's some kind of uh, 
threshold that they have, which is different people have different degrees of confidence in what they're doing. You want to, by, by doing the fourth choice, you sort of ex eliminate that threshold that they just say. It doesn't matter whether you believe you know or not. Just tell me what you think. So you can do a lot of experiments like this. The sort of roughly the bottom line is people can distinguish timing down to almost the millisecond level. If you play someone uh, two events close together and then you move them a little bit, depending on the, what those events are, but if you play in two clicks, they can tell a difference even if you shift the clicks by just maybe one or two milliseconds. If you ask them which one comes first, it's a little harder to tell. The, the difference here is just like a difference in the quality. To actually be able to judge the ordering, it's more like you know, tens of milliseconds. Um, your sensitivity to tuning frequency is about 1%. So if, if I play you a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,000 and 1,010 hertz, you can tell the second one is higher. But if it's smaller than that, you can't really tell. This is like best case, 1%. A musical semitone is 6%, right? So that's like an easily, that's the sort of the minimum musical interval. So we're, we're well below that. If I have a set of harmonics, and if I change the amplitudes of different harmonics, that gives you a different sound, right? Like different vowels. Um, you can measure, like, if I change just one harmonic a little bit, what's the sensitivity there? And it's a few dB. You know, one dB is about... The, another reason we use dB is because one dB is about the smallest change that you would ever care about, and uh, perceptually. And 2 dB is like if you have a set of harmonics and you change one of them by 2 dB, that's when you begin to be able to tell what's going on. Um, there are other effects of uh, the effect of relative phase of different harmonics. Generally speaking, if you have harmonics which are reasonably, you know, sinusoids which are reasonably well separated in frequency, it's not even clear what it would mean to be sensitive to the relative phase, because if they're different frequencies, then obviously the, f the relative phase is changing. But if they're in exactly, if they're in a harmonic relationships are the multiples of a common fundamental, then you'd expect the phase of the more, the more rapid one to be at a constant point relative to the phase of the slower one. So if the slow one goes through zero, the more rapid one should always be at the same point. And, but if they're separating frequency, it turns out we're not very sensitive to that. Although if they're close together in frequency, then you can hear it, but it's not really the phase you're hearing. You're hearing the, the complex interference between them. Um, a lot of experiments have been done using either pure sinusoids or narrowband noise stimuli, and you get different results depending on what you do. A sinusoid is a very stationary, steady noise sound. Noise, like a narrow, filtered white noise, is a more of a fluctuating sound, and that makes it harder to judge things like level because it's got this intrinsic variation anyway. So there's a, you know, there's a whole field of experimental psychophysics based on thinking of new things to try and measure and new, new ways to try and measure it. But basically, you can, there is this ability to, to understand human listeners as these kind of machines that can make measurements, make measurements of sound, but subject to certain limits on their sensitivity, on their sort of noise performance. OK, any questions about that? I guess the bottom line here is just this whole idea of treating human listeners as machines which are able to process sound and then make decisions or make beha have behaviors based on the sound that's coming in. OK, um, let's see. So there's a, a few other things I want to talk about here. Um, pitch perception is, uh, you know, has been widely studied. And that's the idea that you have some kind of periodic signal which, if we put it into our cochlear model, maybe gets resolved as a bunch of harmonics. And the question is, well, what you hear is a particular pitch. How is it that you um, decide you know, what pitch it is, which parts of the signal, if this is like a, a, an approximation of what's going down the auditory nerve, what are the aspects of this information that are important in um, giving you that perception of pitch? Because clearly, there isn't just one thing. You know, if it's a complex signal, there's a lot of different nerve areas being excited. Um, there are basically these two models, two, two things that could be being used. One is the, um, if you look along the, the frequency channel, the sort of the different nerves in the auditory fiber, 
then there are these different, these multiple peaks coming from the individual harmonics of the complex tone. And if you just look for this sort of pattern, if you have a, like a, a template here of what you, where you expect excitation to occur at a particular pitch, you can just take the sort of average excitation, average level of activity on different nerves and figure out, no, notice this pattern and then sort of, you know, get some kind of um, pitch model coming out of that. This is supported by the psychological evidence that the lowest harmonics have the strongest contribution to pitch strength. Um, but there are certain pitch signals you, signals you can produce where they, the average excitation is more or less flat because they're noisy, but you put some structure in and you can still perceive a pitch, and so it's hard to explain that with this kind of model. The alternative to a place model is a so-called um, time model where the, uh, the argument is, well, it's actually the, the temporal structure in each of these different free nerve bands which is important and temporal structure that might be extracted by running autocorrelation in each of those bands. And so you have these kind of multi-band autocorrelation models where you take all the different frequency bands and then you autocorrelate them. And then you have these peaks. You sum up the peaks across the different frequency bands and a particular period will give you uh, a local maximum in that summed peak. This is quite a nice way of explaining a range of phenomena. It works well with these noisy pitch signals. But there are some, but, I, but it turns out that this tends to overestimate the strength of the pitch that you'd hear for a signal that only consisted of high harmonics. It turns out if you take you know, a, a broadband, a buzzy sound, and then you filter it out so that you only keep the, the highest few harmonics, you can still hear a pitch, but the pitch is much weaker than if you include the lower harmonics. The, the fundamental isn't that important. I mean, it, it's helpful, but it's not necessary. But you need some of the harmonics in the range one to six to be able to hear a really strong pitch. So basically, neither of these models is sufficient on its own. And it seems like what happens in the, the brain is some combination of different cues. The brain you know, potentially could look at the frequency bands that are being excited and potentially could try and calculate some kind of timing analysis, like an autocorrelation analysis. And it seems like the best way to understand what's going on is the brain uses all of this information and sort of combines it in some um, opportunistic way. And of course, if you had different sort of random noisy variables that were informing you about a common event, you could actually do the optimal thing. You could make the optimal um, posterior calculation of the, of the thing you're trying to estimate given the evidence. And you know, you can use Bayes' rule to figure out what that is and basically you you're going to multiply together the, the uh, distributions that you infer from the independent dimensions and things like this. I mean, you know, the details depend on how these dimensions depend on each other, but we un we, probability gives us the, the tools to understand how different sources of information can be combined to, to give inferences about a single variable. Yeah? It's not, it's not based on the Gauss. It doesn't matter what the noise. I mean, this, these are just distributions of some kind. But this is, there, it depends on the independence of the different variables that we're measuring. Right? So this, this would be true if, so x, phi, theta is some physical thing, like the frequency, the pitch of the sound we're trying to listen to. And x is some uh, informative variable we've got, like an observation. But x may be a vector, so it may have um, different components, x1 and x2, which could be like, you know, the excitation pattern and the autocorrelation, the summary autocorrelation. And so if I t give you a particular excitation pattern, you can get, you know, you can run your template and you get some estimate of what the posterior probability of the different pitches based on that excitation. And you can do the same thing with your summary autocorrelation. And they're going to give you different answers. So how do you combine them? Well, you could, like, multiply them together for given pitch values, and that will give you something. If they were independent, this would be the optimal way to combine them. But they're not independent, but the, you can imagine the brain sort of having some process for learning these relationships in, a, in an adaptive way. So this is not meant to be a, you know, a, I'm not proposing this particular model. I'm just suggesting the idea that the brain does have all this different sensory information coming in, some of which, and for a particular signal, parts of that may be more or less reliable than others, that there's maybe actual signal noise or there may be sensory noise coming in.
so that you can't always rely on a single queue being available. But you can, it seems like sensory systems, human subjects, and other animals are pretty good at doing close to optimal combinations of multiple sources of evidence to make the best inference about what's going on in the world. At least at a low level, when you have higher level things, you know, humans are notoriously bad at doing these kinds of probability estimates. But the sensory systems, the low level systems, are pretty good at uh, putting this stuff together. Okay, um, we kind of run out of time. Basically, you know, we can, we can take this whole process up a higher level and say, okay, now, rather than looking at tones and noise, what if we look at individual musical sounds? We can ask people, you know, how sensitive they are to the differences between different instruments, how well they can remember melodies, how finely they can uh, perceive individual rhythms and changes in rhythm, and, you know, music, changes in musically relevant uh, criteria. And you get a different set of, you know, functions coming out, a different set of sensitivities, but you can do the same kind of approach of, like, conducting these natural science experiments where you have different stimuli and you try and find out what's going on. But uh, the general message is, you know, we can try and, un we, we have some tools by which we can try and understand uh, human listeners as sensory machines. But, you know, they, they, the more abstract the phenomena you're talking about, like music perception, the harder it is to sort of treat these as objective experiments and the more, you know, less useful the models become. But there's certainly uh, a range. Any uh, final questions? Okay, so on Wednesday we'll have a practical again. This week we're going to be looking at processing again. We're going to just look at some more um, filtering and frequency analysis and try and uh, cement that tool. So I'll see you on Wednesday.